Hello, I'm Betsy Strauss, a member of the Amenia Historical Society. I'm glad that you've joined me today for our virtual tour of the town of Amenia. My plan is to go from one historic sign to another and to share the history of that site or hamlet. Now you may ask, where is Amenia? This map of Dutchess County is probably familiar to many of you. We are reminded that Dutchess County was established in 1683. In the central portion of the county, east of Hyde Park and Rhinebeck, there was the Great Nine Partners patent, granted in 1697. To the north of that was the Little Nine Partners patent, granted in 1706. Along the eastern border of the county, there was a narrow strip of land called the Oblong Patent. The area that became Amenia was comprised of the easternmost tier of lots, that would be lots 28 through 36 of the nine partners, and that section of the Oblong that was contiguous with it. The Oblong was a disputed territory until 1731, when the Treaty of Dover theoretically settled the matter. The long strip of land, approximately one and eight tenths miles wide, was ceded to New York State, while the so-called equivalent land of Stanford, Greenwich, New Canaan, and Darien was granted to Connecticut. You can guess who got the better deal. But we are glad that the beautiful Oblong Valley became part of Amenia. The diagonal line that you see crossing the Hudson River to the northwest was the original incorrect survey line, which was claimed to be the western boundary of Connecticut. Certainly, that mistake was just cause for the dispute. Well, we went from patents to precincts and then to townships. In 1746, Northeast Precinct was formed. It was comprised of the Little Nine Partners and the Oblong Chimney, as it was called, on the east. In 1762, the Amenia Precinct was formed, which included all of the eastern tier of lots, as well as its part of the Oblong. In 1818, Milan broke off from Northeast Precinct to, to become a township. In 1823, Pine Plains followed suit and claimed its township, leaving a very small portion to northeast to form a town. Amenia was asked to give its northern lots, 34, 35, and 36, to northeast, that is, the farmland north of Smithfield, Weebatuck School Road, and the Sharon Station area so that Northeast would have a viable tax base for a town. Until 1823, Amenia's northern border extended north of what is present-day Millerton, a village then not yet born. As we approach Amenia from the west on Route 44, we're following the route of the old Duchess Turnpike, constructed in 1805. It went from Poughkeepsie to Litchfield, Connecticut. This beautiful view from the top of Delavern Hill is certainly pleasant to the eye, as is the meaning of the name Amenia. Today, the Silo Ridge Golf Course and its gated community are under development down below, and so the vista is somewhat altered. As we descend Delavern Hill, we'll take a small detour on the old path to the site of the Delavern grist mill and sawmill, which served the local community for almost two centuries. In the mid-1700s, the Delavern family owned 1,000 acres on the hill, including the mill and what is today the Silo Ridge property. Let's take a look at our Amenia tour map and review our route. You can see the hairpin turn as we come down Delavern Hill from the west. At the intersection with Route 22, we will turn left and drive north for one mile in order to see the earliest hamlet of Amenia. Then we will come back to the Four Corners and continue south to Wasaic, and then on to the Steelworks. From there, we will travel in a counterclockwise direction into the Oblong Valley, visiting the hamlets of South Amenia, 
Amenia Union, and on up to the northern point of our tour at Troutbeck in Leedsville. Here we are at the Amenia Four Corners, which came into existence after the Duchess Turnpike was constructed in 1805. Looking north, on the right, we see the Amenia Bank, established in 1864, which looks almost the same today. The Guernsey Fountain is still standing, but it has been moved to a spot in front of the bank as part of the Veterans Park. A hotel has been in evidence on the left corner since the early 1800s. The structure in this picture was known as the Pratt Hotel. It was renamed the Delavern Farms Hotel in the mid-1900s. Sadly, this much-loved gathering place burned down in 1974. On this historic site today, we have the original Four Brothers restaurant and their outdoor movie theater behind it. All right, let's drive up Route 22 for about one mile. The Red Meeting House was built in 1758, although the, its congregation was organized 10 years earlier in 1748. The lands for the church, the parsonage, and the Amenia burying ground were donated by Stephen Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins and his large family came from Harwinton, Connecticut in 1744. Having purchased lot 32 of the nine partners, Hopkins sold parcels to new settlers who were migrating from Connecticut in search of inexpensive farmland and freedom of religion. Hopkins had seven sons, six of whom served in the Revolutionary War. Three went to Vermont with Ethan Allen, and two of them were killed there. Four remained in Amenia, but Michael died before the war. Roswell, Reuben, and Noah Hopkins were officers in the New York 6th Regiment. Let's take a peek into the old Amenia burying ground, which is still very well cared for, and see Stephen Hopkins Stone, Stephen was the first town or precinct supervisor in 1762, and his son Michael was chosen as the first town clerk. His son Roswell was a justice of the peace under the crown. It is said that he performed more marriages in Armenia than any of the ministers of the day. Roswell Hopkins Esquire eventually moved to Vermont, where several members of the family had already relocated before the war. As we head south back to the intersection, we see on our left the historic sign for the site of the Amenia Seminary. This school was established by, but not limited to, the Methodists and was active from 1835 to 1888. The seminary was a highly acclaimed coeducational boarding school, the first co-ed academy in the state, we are told. Amenia Seminary prepared many teachers, college professors, and college presidents. It produced several officers for the Civil War, as well as ministers and missionaries. Its reputation attracted students from every state in the Union and from several foreign countries. Much to its credit, the school's philosophy inspired students to pursue excellence in education and altruism in serving others. In 1929, the seminary property was purchased for the new Amenia High School. At present, it is the home of the Amenia Town Hall and also the home of the Amenia Historical Society, for which we are very thankful. Our next historic sign is located about three miles south of the village of Amenia on the west side of Route 22 at the entrance to Deep Hollow Road. This sign announces the fact that the Gridley Ironworks of the 1800s was located in this area. Specifically, the two beehive-shaped charcoal kilns located just a few feet away on Deep Hollow Road are impressive reminders of a bygone era when the hills were stripped of their forests for charcoal and the land was gouged by pick and shovel for iron ore. These structures were copied from similar ones in Central America in 1825 when the Gridleys were beginning their enterprise at Wasaic. Gridley's blast furnace was also built in 1825. 
not far from the kilns on the bank of the creek. It was built by Nathaniel Gridley and his son Noah Gridley and by Josiah Reed and Lehman Bradley of Connecticut. The furnace is no longer standing and the site is now hidden by Route 22, which passes overhead. Iron Master Noah Gridley lived from 1802 to 1887. In order to be able to mix ores from different locations and improve the strength and purity of his iron, Gridley needed the railroad. Around 1850, he approached Cornelius Vanderbilt about the possibility of extending the railroad north from Pauling on up to Chatham. Gridley offered to pay for the undertaking himself. In 1851, the work was accomplished, bringing more to Wasaic than iron ore. Irish immigrants were arriving on U.S. shores, and some of them found their way to Wasaic and Amenia. By 1864, the Amenia Mining Company employed over 150 men, many of whom were Irish. Noah Gridley's elder son, Henry, was not destined to be part of the family business for long. After graduating from Amherst College in 1862, Henry Gridley responded to the Union's call to arms. Because he was much admired in the area, several other young men eagerly joined with him. Henry Gridley was an officer in the first company to be formed, Company A of the Dutchess County 150th Regiment. Tragically, he was killed in action in 1864. Noah Gridley's younger son, Edward, remained as his business partner for the most of three decades until appendicitis took his life in 1887. Master Noah Gridley died just two months after Edward's death, bringing an end to the family dynasty. The home of the Gridley family is still standing, as is the Gridley Chapel across the street from it. Mrs. Gridley was Emmeline Reed before she married, the sister of Amenia historian Newton Reed. You will hear more about the Reed family throughout our tour. Well, if you have a railroad coming through your village, you need a hotel. Gridley built the Wasaic Hotel, or the Wasaic House as it was called, in 1851 to provide housing for travelers and businessmen. The hotel is still standing. It is attached to what was Max and Mills and what is today the home of Wasaic Project an artist-in-residence program. One businessman we know of who actually had his room and his office in the hotel was none other than Mr. Gail Borden, the founder of the New York Condensed Milk Company. In 1861, after rather two unsuccessful attempts in Connecticut, Borden contacted Mr. Gridley with the idea of establishing a condensed milk factory in the beautiful Harlem Valley. The area was favorable for dairy farming, and the railroad made the shipping of his products quite doable. Gridley agreed and provided Borden with the land and a small building on the west side of the railroad tracks. With the Civil War underway, Borden recognized the opportunity to provide the Union Army with canned milk. This arrangement with the government put the Borden milk business on the road to success. Farmers for miles around increased the number of their cows and began bringing their milk to the Borden's factory. Gail Borden was one of the founders of the First National Bank of Amenia in 1864. That was also the year that he started a new factory in Brewster, New York, just down the line. After the Civil War ended, Borden's condensed milk became available to the general public. Milk factories began springing up in many other places, Elgin, Illinois, Norwich, New York, and York, Pennsylvania, to name a few. Borden died unexpectedly in 1874 but his sons carried on the business. Maintaining cleanliness and sanitation from start to finish were very important to the production of condensed milk. It was essential that the milk coming from farms be pure and fresh. 
Workers in the factory were well-trained for excellence and efficiency. In 1887, 56 women and men were needed in the process of condensing and canning 33,000 quarts of milk a day. Making the tin cans and the wooden shipping boxes were part of the daily work as well. Ice harvesting and the storage of ice used for cooling the milk was another necessary business. By 1880, the transition in the economy of the area from mining to farming was taking place. Many of the Irish iron ore miners became dairy farmers, trading one type of hard work for another. Owning your own farm and being your own boss were appealing benefits of farming. Amenia's Irish farmers included the McEnroe's, the Murphy's, the Maroney's, and the Cane's. Within one generation, this McEnroe family took to farming, and some of its descendants are still farming today. In the late 1800s, mining in the area was on the decline. Agricultural advances, new farm machinery, and the development of the Grange organization all encouraged dairy farmers to compete and strive for excellence. Borden's was the biggest employer in Amenia until the state school, Taconic DDSO, was established in 1929. All right, let's now move along on our route, going about a mile and a half further south to the next historic marker. This sign refers to the site of the steelworks a manufactory of iron and steel owned by Captain James Reed and his brother Ezra Reed, among others. At the time of the Revolutionary War, weapons were produced here for the Continental Army. But first, let's look at the backstory on Captain James Reed. In 1759, Captain James Reed traveled through the Oblong Valley on his way to Quebec with a company of Connecticut soldiers. Before they traveled much further north, a report of victory at the Battle of Quebec reached the troops and they retraced their steps. Once he got back home to Norwalk, Connecticut, young James asked his father to purchase land for him in the lovely area of South Amenia. We can assume that James Reed must have met the innkeeper's daughter on his first visit because only months later, after his father purchased 53 acres for him in South Amenia, he married Joanna Castle and settled not far from Squire Castle's tavern. James Reed was an enterprising man, conducting a general store, acquiring a saw and grist mill, and establishing the forge at the steelworks. It is said that he left a goodly inheritance to each of his 12 children. The actual site of the steelworks dam on the Wasse Creek is shown here on the left side of this picture, the rubble across the stream bed. The two gentlemen leaning on the fence, no doubt, are contemplating what might have taken place at the steelworks some 150 years earlier. Cornelius Atherton was the skilled steelmaker who had a contract with the colonial government in 1775 to make firearms for the soldiers. On September 17, 1776, Cornelius Atherton petitioned the New York Council to exempt his trained workmen from serving in the militia. It is probable that his request was denied because by the next year, he and his family were living in Wyoming Valley, Pennsylvania, where he was a blacksmith. When the Wyoming Valley Massacre took place in 1778, Atherton had just enough time to make a raft and escape with his family down the Susquehanna River. His eldest son remained as part of the fighting force against the Indians, and he was killed. Here we see an example of the fine workmanship of Cornelius Atherton, a rifle which is on display at Fort Ticonderoga Museum. His name is inscribed on the barrel. 
Before we leave the steelworks site, I want to tell you another story or two. This ancient document from 1788 records the manumission of two slaves belonging to Ezra Reed. The slaves were Jeduthun Mondor and his mother, we don't know her first name, the wife of Joel Mondor. Joel Mondor, it states, was formerly a servant, probably a freed slave, of Ezra Reed, who co-owned the steelworks with his brother James Reed. It is likely that Joel Mondor and his son worked at the steelworks. Ezra Reed freed his slaves before moving to Hudson, New York in 1788. The Mondor family continued to live near the steelworks until sometime between 1820 and 1830 when they moved to Roxbury, New York. A Mondor descendant has written to me within the past decade requesting information about her ancestors and sharing information with us. Well, we cannot leave the Steelworks area without mentioning Amenia's first settler, Richard Sackett, and his monument. In 1704, Richard Sackett of New York City purchased a vast amount of land from the Indians in Washeg, as it was called. It is said that he built a cabin and installed his family there for a summer. However, he could not have stayed very long because in 1706, Sackett became one of the Little Nine partners, owning much land in the Pine Plains area. Then, in 1711, he was appointed by Governor Hunter to oversee the Palatine refugees at East Camp, or Germantown, in Columbia County. Sackett's claim to 7,500 acres in Wasaic and eastward to Connecticut was denied, probably because it was already owned by some of the nine partners. In 1746, Sackett died and was buried in his field, which soon became the Steelworks Cemetery. Our tour map did not indicate the water sources in Amenia. On this map, I would like to point out the course of the Wasaic Creek on the west side of town, coming down from Smithfield, down through the mountains to Wasaic, and then on to the steelworks and south. There is also a central stream that flows into Wasaic, originating from the iron ore beds above the Delavern Mill Pond and on down. On the east side of the town, we have the Weebatuck Creek, which originates north of Millerton and flows down through the Oblong Valley with just a small detour into Sharon Valley, returning to Amenia at Leedsville and continuing south near Amenia Union and on to South Amenia. These two main tributaries meet each other in the south part of town, forming the Ten Mile River. Having spent a good deal of time on what was the steelworks, we now will become acquainted with South Amenia. I mentioned it earlier in regard to Captain James Reed's 53 acres and his marriage to Johanna Castle, the innkeeper's daughter. As we look at this map, we can see the word hotel at the southwest corner of the intersection. Squire Castle had his home and tavern at that location. Notice the opposite corner that says Winchester and the property on the north side of the highway that says store and PO or post office. We will refer to those a bit later. The historic sign in South Amenia was erected in recognition of the Nook, a place on the Weebatuck Creek where the Native Americans were known to have had their powwows in the 1700s and early 1800s. Historian Newton Reed included this information in his book, Early History of Amenia. A more recent historian, the late Kenneth Hodley, had a hobby of collecting arrowheads. He found over 1,000 projectile points, as they are now called, and other Native American artifacts in this part of the Oblong. Hodley's collection is now housed in the New York State Museum at Albany. In the background of this photo is the South Amenia Presbyterian Church. The South Amenia Presbyterian Church was built in 1880. 
and it is the third location for a congregation which began in Armenia Union in 1759. It was then known as the Oblong Society. The second location was almost halfway between Armenia Union and South Armenia. The population and commerce seemed to be moving towards South Armenia in those days. In addition to owning a tavern, Daniel Castle Esquire, also a justice of the peace, is said to have built a mill and a tannery. He also built a hat factory at South Amenia in around 1760. The building burned down, but the original two rooms of the building endured the fire. The present house that you see here was built in stages around the two rooms. In the early 1800s, a second story was added by Henry Winchester, who used the house for his hat factory. Amariah Winchester, the father of Henry Winchester, was the first hat maker in the Winchester line. He arrived in Amenia in 1783 and settled just north of Amenia Union. He made beaver hats and felted wool hats until his death in 1842. His son Henry bought the hat factory at South Amenia, but predeceased his father in 1829. Sometime before 1850, Amariah Winchester's grandson, Milo Follett Winchester II, bought the store and post office at South Amenia, which is located on the north side of the intersection. Milo bought his Uncle Henry's house, and it has been called the Winchester House ever since. Milo served as postmaster longer than any other postmaster in the USA, it said, from 1847 until his death in 1909. His son, another Henry, was the Dutchess County clerk during the World War I years. And that Henry had a son, another Milo Follett Winchester, who became Dutchess County school superintendent in the mid-1900s. The Winchester house was in the family until 1976, both house and the store are still standing. Another influential family of South Amenia was the Barlow family. The Barlows were Mayflower descendants from Sandwich, Mass, who came to Amenia in 1756. They had had enough of the seafaring trade with its inevitable perils at sea and decided to become farmers. This house on the South Road was built for Deacon Moses Barlow by his son-in-law before the Revolutionary War. It is still standing. About halfway between South Amenia and Amenia Union is the lovely South Amenia Cemetery. It was established in the late 1700s when the second church building was located across the road. Just north of where the church once stood, was the home of Newton Reed, Amenia's foremost historian. Newton Reed's grandfather, Eliakim Reed, was a brother of James and Ezra Reed, mentioned earlier. He bought the place when it was a single room house in the 1760s and enlarged it as his family grew in size. It was in this neighborhood that Newton Reed became a student of nature and of agriculture. He and his son, encouraged local farmers to plant fruit trees and to utilize modern methods of farming. He wrote many articles for the newspaper and for agricultural journals of the day. He was often called upon to give lectures on local history. Newton Reed was an elder in the church right next door for 70 years. Several progressive farmers from Amenia and Sharon formed a land company in order to invest in the development of agriculture in the Dakota Territory. In 1880, Newton Reed traveled out west to visit the Chaffee family who had left our area to manage the cooperative Bonanza Farm in the new town of Amenia, North Dakota. Our next hamlet of historic significance is one I have already referred to a few times, Amenia Union formerly known as Winnegar's and then as Hitchcock's Corners. 
It is unique in that it straddles the New York-Connecticut state line. Its commerce and community life was shared without any separation of activity, except for the two school districts and the taxes that supported them. While the Weebetuck Creek flowed by on the west, it was the water of Connecticut's Mill Brook that provided power for the mills and factories in the hamlet. There was a knitting factory, the Buckley Plow Factory, a tannery, and other businesses that made this a lively center during the 1800s. Reverend Niblo's church was on the New York side, while his home was on the Connecticut side of the line. North of the village were the homes of the Winnegars, the Delamaters, and the Rao families that we will mention shortly, and the cemetery in which some of them were buried. There are two historic signs in Amenia Union. The first one highlights the man who named Amenia and Vermont, Dr. Thomas Young a Revolutionary War patriot and friend of Ethan Allen. We'll share more about his colorful life a little later. The building in the background was a store owned by many different storekeepers over the years, by Mr. Lambert in the mid-1800s, and lastly, by Mr. Henry Cross a century later. At the other end of Main Street is the second historic marker, which indicates the hamlet's alternate name of Hitchcock's Corners. The folks in Connecticut prefer this name. An example of the Buckley Plow is on display on the green, and the Hitchcock House is in the background. The road to the right leads to the village of Sharon, Connecticut. It was Solomon Hitchcock who established his home and store at this intersection around 1800. We are told that his house was built by James Reed for one of his sons in 1783. It is still a strong, handsome structure today. Up the road a piece, as they say, is the historic marker for the site of the Winnegar homestead. Ulrich Winnegar and his son Garrett came from East Camp of the Palatines in 1724. At this early date, only Sackett had laid claim to land in the area. Some historians think it may have been Sackett who encouraged the Winnegars to settle this far from the Hudson River. There were other German Palatines, however, who came with the Winnegars, the families of Schneider, Nace, and Rau. In 1739, Garrett Winnegar purchased of Daniel Jackson his Connecticut land and gristmill at Amenia Union. Garrett moved his family into Jackson's house, thus becoming residents of Sharon, Connecticut at the time. On the Winnegar land on the Amenia side, this impressive stone house was built by Captain Garrett Winnegar's son Heinrich in 1761. The house did not remain in the Winnegar family for more than one generation, however, because Henry's children moved to Kent, Connecticut. 200 years later, the grand old house was in disrepair and threatening to collapse. The Amenia Historical Society attempted to save it in the 1970s. A snowstorm in 1996 brought the house down. At this point, I will share the story of Dr. Thomas Young because he was connected with the Winninger family. Dr. Thomas Young came to Amenia Union from Orange County. He practiced medicine in the area, but lived with Garrett Winninger's family on the Sharon side of the line. Around 1755, he married Winninger's daughter, Mary. Although Thomas Young was a brilliant man and gifted in many ways, he had a cocky attitude. He was indicted for blasphemy in 1756 after declaring that Jesus Christ was a knave and a fool. He later recanted his statement in order to clear his name. Young was a close friend of Ethan Allen, and along with Allen, he wrote revolutionary treatises, the most notable of which was Reason, the Only Oracle of Man. He also wrote an epic poem about the Battle of Quebec. 
It was Thomas Young's love of Latin that influenced his creation of the names for Amenia in Vermont in 1762. He coined the word Amenia from the Latin word amoina, meaning pleasant to behold. Dr. Thomas Young was a political firebrand. Desiring to take part in the revolutionary issues of the day, he moved with his family to Boston. There he was definitely a controversial figure, but he proved useful to both Samuel Adams and John Adams, among others. His seven years in Boston culminated in 1773 when he participated in the Boston Tea Party without wearing a disguise. He was pursued by the British and fled first to Providence, Rhode Island, and then to Philadelphia. There he worked with Dr. Benjamin Rush in the military hospital. In 1777, Dr. Young died of a virulent camp fever and was probably buried in the mass grave for others suffering the same fate. Mary Young and her children returned to their Winnegar relatives in the Menu Union. Just north of the Winnegar house was the home of Captain Isaac Delamater. The Delamaters were of Huguenot descent and moved from Kinderhook to Amenia before 1740 with a large family and several slaves. It is said that Isaac bought a farm for each of his sons. He was a justice of the peace and also a patriot known to have trained the local militia on the field near his house. Captain Isaac Delamater died April 20th, 1775, the day after the Battle of Lexington and Concord. He was buried in the family burying ground just across the road from his house. In recent years, the present owners of the property have unearthed gravestones of the Delamaters, gravestones which had been broken and buried by farm plows over the centuries. The burying ground of the Delamater slaves is also on the family farm. A newspaper article of 1886 stated that it was on the west side of the road on a little hill on the other side of the stream. We have yet to locate the exact spot. This ancient document recorded the marriage of a slave named Dick Delamater to Jude Robbins on September 9, 1769 by Reverend Ebenezer Niblo. The record was recopied by Roswell Hopkins' clerk on August 23, 1775. Nicholas Rao and his wife, Susanna Winnegar, the sister of Mrs. Thomas Young, settled just north of the Delamaters. Nicholas Rao's father was Johannes Rao, also known as Moravian John. In 1746, Johannes Rao left his home in Pine Plains and came to Amenia Union to live with his son, Nicholas. This monument was placed in the Amenia Union Cemetery by the Moravian College of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The inscription on it tells the gist of Moravian John's story father of the Rao family in America, expatriated because of Protestant family religion from the Palatinate, many immigrated to England and after to America in 1710. He was known as the Indians and missionaries friend. His daughter Jeanette gave her life and died doing missionary work among the Indian tribes in 1749. The Moravian mission near Pine Plains lasted just five years, from 1740 until 1745, until the missionaries, including Rao's daughter and their Native American converts to Christianity, were hatefully driven out by the English-speaking settlers of the area. Because Johannes Rao spoke German, he had welcomed the Moravian missionaries and had become their friend. The complete story of this tragedy can be found in the annals of the Moravian Church, as well as in the history of Pine Plains and in the book Martyrs of the Oblong in Little Nine by DeCost Smith. Well, 
Here we are in the hamlet of Leedsville, where we find the last historic marker on our tour, Troutbeck, former home of Myron Benton, and many others, I might add, many more Bentons and also the Spingarns. On this map of 1850, we see the name Benton at the intersection of the Leedsville Road and the East-West Roads. The upper roads to the right lead to Sharon, Connecticut. The roads to the left lead directly through the place called Troutbeck and on to Amenia. The Weebetuck Creek flows from the east and the Dunham Brook from the west, joining forces just north of where you see the word mill. The Benton's farm was surrounded by industry and community in the 1800s, including a woolen mill and a wheelwright factory. When the Spingarns bought Troutbeck in 1910, they strove to make it more secluded. They moved the district schoolhouse off the property and straightened the Leedsville Road due north, connecting it with the upper highway, Route 343 as it is today. They even exhumed Benton's bones from the family's tranquil burying ground and moved them to the South Amenia Cemetery. John Delamater, son of Captain Isaac Delamater, had a mill just south of where the two streams meet. He built this sturdy home in 1761. Delamater placed something special in the gable end of the house. He inlaid black bricks, spelling his and his wife's initials into the red brick wall, J and M D L M 1761 for John and Mary Delamater. This house still stands on the Troutbeck estate. In 1794, the Caleb Benton family moved from Guilford, Connecticut to their beautiful new home in Amenia. A year later, the elder son, Joel, married a young woman from Sharon. His parents built a home for him and his wife on the east side of the Weebetuck Creek. They named it Century Cottage. The Troutbeck homestead, though it was not yet given that name, was on the west side of the Weebetuck Creek. Caleb and Sarah's younger son, William, was only five years old when they moved there, but the estate became his home when his parents passed away. Harmony Bridge connected the two Benton homes. The name Joel Benton is most well known through Joel the first grandson, Joel Benton the second. All of the Bentons were lovers of literature. In 1852, Joel Benton the second was an enthusiastic graduate and poet laureate of Amenia Seminary when he set about to found the first newspaper in the area, the Amenia Times. Here he is as an older distinguished gentleman Joel Benton was a thinker and a writer. He hosted many other thinkers and writers at Century Cottage and held public lectures when visiting speakers were willing to speak on topics of interest such as the temperance movement, women's suffrage, and authors of the day. Some of his literary friends included Horace Greeley, Margaret Fuller, Wendell Phillips, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Mark Twain. Among his writings, we have Emerson as a Poet, In Poe Circle, Greeley on Lincoln, and Persons, Places, and Memories of the Twilight Club. Meanwhile, in the Troutbeck homestead, William A. Benton raised a family of 15 children, mothered by two sisters, Cythera and Betsy Reed, you guessed it, sisters of Newton Reed, the Reed women, each in their turn, added to the Benton love of literature and writing. Myron Benton was a poet and a nature lover. After Father William passed away, Myron took over the care and cultivation of Troutbeck with passion and idealism. He was a quiet, gentle person who was content to observe his rural surroundings using Troutbeck as his muse in poetry and in art. His wife was Mary Anna Adams of Poughkeepsie. 
They were disappointed not to be able to have children, but they filled their lives with farming and gardening, as well as with hosting other friends of similar interests. Literary greats, such as John Burroughs and Henry David Thoreau, were guests at Troutbeck. Here we see Burroughs looking into the Trout Spring at Troutbeck. Other literary friends of the Burroughs included Moncur de Conway, Richard H. Stoddard, Mrs. Elizabeth Stoddard, Mrs. Elizabeth Akers Allen, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Among Myron Benton's writings were his poetry, Songs of the Weebatuck, as well as Thoreau's Last Letter and Indians of the Weebatuck Valley. Charles Benton was the youngest of William Benton's 15 children. We see him here as a thoughtful young man and then as an even wiser old man. Like his brother Myron, Charles had a love for Troutbeck, for farming, for nature, and for writing. Like his uncle Newton Reed, he was a historian and a writer of agricultural articles. Charles recorded the family history of his mother's side of the family, as well as that of the Benton side of the family. His traumatic Civil War experience is detailed in his book, As Seen from the Ranks. As a soldier in the 150th, he became a surgeon's assistant at Gettysburg, facing the grim reality of the war. Charles Benton wrote the history of Troutbeck from ancient times up through his years of correspondence with the new owner, Mr. Joel E. Spingarn. Joel Elias Spingarn purchased Troutbeck in 1910 after having been a professor of literature at Columbia University in New York City. He not only became a country gentleman, but he immersed himself in the Benton mystique, eager to learn the Benton ways. He purchased the Amenia Times and renamed it Harlem Valley Times. Spingarn organized the Amenia Field Day, an experiment in rural recreation, as he called it, for five consecutive summers. Here we see the folks arriving at Amenia Station by train and then going by wagon to Troutbeck for the day. There were 10,000 people in attendance in 1913. Not sure how many were there in 1914, but listed on the program of events were the traditional foot races, the greased pig chase, and tug of war. There was also horseback riding events, shooting competitions, a baseball game, and dancing accompanied by a local orchestra. Joel Spingarn was a civil rights activist a major in the Army during World War I, and a community leader throughout his years in Amenia, organizing the Home Guard as soon as war was declared, raising funds for the war effort, and some years later establishing a Veterans Memorial Park. This is a picture of Troutbeck in 1916, before the fire in 1917. Besides the extensive damage to the house, an entire collection of Amenia Times from 1852 to 1917 was lost in the fire. Though Spingarn was away during the war years, reconstruction of the house was completed within two years. Joel and his brother Arthur Spingarn were charter members of the NAACP. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In 1916, they hosted the first NAACP conference at Troutbeck. W.E.B. Du Bois was in attendance and recorded his impressions of the event in a booklet. It was a congenial and unifying experience. In 1933, Troutbeck was once again the meeting place for the NAACP conference. Many artists, writers, and scholars visited Troutbeck, and some decided to stay. Author, scholar Lewis Mumford and his wife, Sophie Mumford. Lawyer, poet Melville Kane and his wife, Florence Kane. Thurgood Marshall. UN lawyer, Gurdon Waddles 
and his author wife, Santa Waddles. In his later years, Joel Spingarn became interested in horticulture and specialized in many varieties of clematis. Here we see his clematis growing in front of the restored Troutbeck Mansion. Spingarn was also a charter member of the Dutchess County Historical Society and hosted the society at Troutbeck on more than one occasion. Amy Spingarn, Joel's wife, was an accomplished poet and painter in her own right. She was a social activist and a mother of four beautiful children. As a leader in the Dutchess County chapter of the women's suffrage movement, Amy Spingarn arranged for its members to participate in the annual Amenia Field Day with a parade of women in white dresses carrying banners and state shields and with speeches or debates scheduled as part of the program. Mrs. Spingarn wrote newspaper articles on women's suffrage. She pressed politicians for their support. She organized lectures and raised funds and participated in marches for the cause. Here we have a handsome portrait of Amy Spingarn and her four children. Joel Spingarn passed away in 1939, leaving Amy as mistress of Troutbeck. She had an apartment in New York City, but spent weekends, summers, and holidays at her country home until her death in 1980 at the age of 97. After Troutbeck was sold, it was developed into the Troutbeck Inn and Conference Center. With this 2003 photo of Troutbeck, we will conclude our tour of Amenia. To learn more about Amenia history, please visit our Historical Society Archive and Exhibit Room at 4988 Route 22 in Amenia, New York.